Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Primetime. Primetime is the Bethel University Library program that is a collaboration between the Friends of the Bethel University Library, Academic Affairs, and other offices on campus that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. Thank you for joining us. If you miss any presentations or would like to see past events, they are archived in the community video collection in the Bethel Digital Library on the library website. Today I'm delighted to welcome to you an Edgren Scholars presentation. The Edgren Scholars program supports faculty student research teams as they collaborate on a research project. The project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to a given field of study and the project must reflect meaningful collaboration on research between students and faculty. The Edgren Scholars Program is named after John Alexis Edgren, the founder of what is now Bethel University. One of the key educational principles that Edgren articulated in the 19th century was this. The relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. It is in this spirit that we established the Edgren Scholars Program in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. Dr. Peggy Kendall, Professor of Communication Studies, and Tristan <coughs> Thomas, a senior major in, in Communication Studies, are one Edgren team who were awarded that designation uh, this past spring and worked together this summer. Peggy and Tristan spent last summer studying the psychological safety of online workers and determining management solutions to help create safe and satisfying virtual workplaces. Let's learn more about their research. Excellent. So uh, I just want to start by saying thank you for being here. Um, we, had a, we had a really good time this summer, and we started this whole research project. Um, I would call it a pilot study that um, I'll probably continue uh, after we get going. It was fun because um, the people that we talked with, it was like such clear information that we were getting, such clear results that are different than, than I've seen. Um, and it was fun doing qualitative research um, because it's a very creative, collaborative process. Um, so we are going to describe some of the things that we did, some of the things that we found, and Tristan is in charge, doing his thing, and go for it. Thank you, Becky, I appreciate that. All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for sharing the time with us today, along with Peggy and I, as we talk about something that we hope you can take with you to develop you, and not only you, but also the people around you. All right, so let's get started. So I do want to do a quick survey. How many of us have been a part of remote work or is actively a part of remote work today? Okay, majority of us. So I, don't, I do want to say fully online is at least about 13%, and at hybrid, it's almost at 28%. All right, so these numbers are increasing as we speak. But did you know 57% said they would look for another job if the employee did not allow remote work? That's a little bit over half. But what's also is interesting as well is 98% said they desire at least remote work, at least part-time. Right? And we can attest to that. We at least just want part-time of remote work. Well, could it be because on average, remote <coughs> work earns 19000 more than in-office workers with them at 74000 on average and in-office at 55000 Could be. And could that be the reason why in 2025 that 36.2 million Americans will, will work remote online? Employees, could that be? But I do want to spend time on this point right here. One in four managers report that the teams are less creative after moving to remote work, right? With 70% of remote workers feel left out of their workplace. One in four managers. And this is all wrapped up in a term, which is our main focal point of today. And this term is called psychological safety. Has any of us heard of this term before? Psychological safety? Okay, one. So what is that? It's a belief that one is able to express his or herself without the fear of negative consequences to their self-image, status, and career. And this is important because it's the number one characteristic for a high-performing team. Not number two. Not three, not two and a half. It's the number one characteristic for a high-performing team. It improves innovation and creativity. 
increases employee satisfaction, organizational commitment, work engagement, positive attitude towards teamwork. But again, it's the number one characteristic for a high performing team. We all desire this high performing team. We all desire a successful team. And as remote work begins on an uptrend, we seem to have this harm in our psychological safety. So our research today and our goal for this research was to, say, was to find this conflict in our psychological safety and how can we better increase it within our workplace. So my partner Peggy will go over the methods of our research. All right, so one of the things, here let me stand over here, one of the things we, we started off with is we, there's management approaches that we've been using for decades. Um, but we're thinking to ourselves, you know what, these management approaches have got to change in an online environment. They cannot be the same. So the research that supported things 20 years ago is not the same research as today. So we sort of dove into this idea of, all right, what are differences in management approaches um, in an online environment? And one of the very first things we started to zoom in on is this idea of psychological safety. So uh, if you haven't had a qualitative methodology, which it looks like no one here has, so this is good. Um, basically, with qualitative methodology, um, you go in just asking a lot of questions. So this is some of the things that we did. Um, first of all, of course, we got IRB approval because uh, we interviewed people. We we're going to interview people and record it, so we needed IRB approval. Um, we came up with a list of questions based on some of the things that we were reading in the literature. Uh, the way that we found participants was through LinkedIn, uh, social media, um, friends that we knew that were working online, things like that. Um, they signed consent forms. And then we had um, usually about 45 minutes to an hour interview on Zoom. And it was recorded. These were semi-structured interviews. So we, we would kind of stick with the questions. But if the person who was talking sort of uh, got us into a different area of um, conversation, then that was probably important. We wanted to, um, to honor that. Then we took the transcriptions. We edited them. Um, we moved all the, I removed all the identifying information. And then we got into this idea, of, into the process of grounded theory. All right, so with a grounded theory approach, um, what we did first was open coding. Uh, and we have all these pages and pages of uh, transcriptions. And so then we had, to, we had 15 interviews that we did this summer. Um, then we had to reduce the data. So you go through and you take pieces of each one and put them into different columns, into different codes, right? And then we did some microanalysis. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, axial coding then, when you have your main categories and you try, you ask yourself, okay, how do these categories actually relate to one another? And then from there, which we actually, I, I didn't think we'd get this far, but we actually did start to get into this idea of creating theory, letting the data speak for itself. So just real quick, uh, this is some of the ways that we uh, reduced the data. We went in, we, took, we grabbed pieces of the transcript, and we put them in these different coding categories. Microanalysis. So then it's like, all right, well, we have all this data here. So what? Like, what's important here? Uh, so one of the things you do is this idea of microanalysis. We ask interesting questions. And this is a really creative piece, right? This is where it's like, you know, how can we see things differently? So we ask things like who, what, where, why, when, um, all of these different kinds of things. These are some examples of some of the, the things we came up with. Um, so for instance, um, uh, we ask the question, uh, think of a time when you had a question or you disagreed, but you decided not to say anything. And then we said, well, what was going on there, right? So that was sort of the, the major data that we were looking at. And so we asked ourselves, well, OK, so what's one of the best mediums? You know, how, how do they ask questions? Um, why don't they? Uh, they came up with these words, these important words that were like, there's some meaning behind here. Like, what's a good manager? Like, if I disagree with the manager, well, maybe I'm not really disagreeing. So what does disagree mean, right? What does a lot of people talk? It was. It was really powerful. A lot of people talked about how lonely they were working remotely. So what does lonely look like? How, how does lonely fit? 
Um, I think one of the best things that one of our um, participants said was this idea of perceived frenzy. That was why he never asked questions, because there is a perceived frenzy in the culture of the organization. And so we really zoomed in on some of those kinds of words. Um, other questions, when's the best time to ask a question? How long should we wait for a reply? We ask all these questions with the data, and we kind of turn it around. And from there, that's when we put it into the different codes. Right? And this whole thing is iterative. So once we kind of started zooming in on psychological safety and even zooming in even more on this idea of busyness and perceived frenzy, um, we did change some of the interview questions um, and ask even more deeper questions about those specific things. So it's an iterative process. Right? Um, and then we throw it all up in a board, and we're trying to figure out all these different categories. This is so fun. Um, and this is one of the ways that we did this. Uh, we, we did mind mapping, and we did all sorts of different creative things. These are all color coded, by the way. Um, we put all this together. Um, and then the next thing that we came up with are some of the results that we would like to share. Thank you, Peggy. Now we're going to get into what you guys all came for, is figuring out what is the results of this? What do we find? Okay, and we start after we interviewed all our participants, we seen these certain patterns that start to appear, that start to came up. And we categorized them in three categories. And these three categories was image management, this relationship uncertainty, and this organizational <coughs> culture, right? So I first want to start with image management. What do I mean by image management? That's the protection of your self-image or protecting your work image. You know, I, have, I need help. I, I need help with something, but I should know this or I will learn this, right? A participant said this, I don't want to message them back to back with something. So that's why I would have to figure out first before I message them because the answer could have been right in front of my face. Could have been right there. So I should know this. I don't want to look dumb. I don't want to look incompetent. So I don't want to ask for help to protect my self-image. Or I should learn this, or I should YouTube it and learning myself, and I know we're all victims of this, right? YouTube, Google's our best friend, we all use that phrase. Um, I should YouTube this in order to learn this because I don't want to look incompetent. I want to protect my self-image or my work image. Or we may assume that no one else agrees or assume an image through the screen. What do I mean by image through the screen? Participants said it well. So I always second guess saying something because I don't want someone to read it off as me being unprofessional, rude, or disrespectful. Right? So we are sitting behind the screen. We're losing this face-to-face -face interaction. Right? We can't see body language. can't see face expressions unless we're on Zoom. Half of the time, our cameras are off anyway. Um, so we're losing this you know, face-to-face this -face communication, all this. And we're just sitting behind the screen. We're typing things out. We see something pop up. Right? We know we need to fix something. But we're afraid that we are looking unprofessional, rude, or disrespectful. So we second guess typing out an email. And then we think. Is it even worth sending out anyway? Should we just send it out anyway, or should we just stay quiet to protect our self-image? Or we may compare ourselves with others. Right? I don't want to push back to my manager's leadership, especially. I wanted to do what was asked of me because I'm just an employee. It's just my job. I don't want to push back. I know I have leadership characteristics. I know I'm creative. I know I can bring out the best for the team. But I'd rather just stay quiet to protect again this work image. And then along with image management, we fall into this relationship uncertainty. So I don't know them that well. Right? And when you don't know someone that well, you lose this trust piece. So this trust piece is not there. Right? So I've seen how they act with other people. I've seen how this group act with other people. They're all just click, as we may say. Which is why I don't trust them, because I feel as if I would get the same behavior. So I don't, I'm not unsure of this relationship. Well, I'm unsure of this relationship. I don't know them that well, so I should just stay to myself, not be creative, not ask for help. I should just be to myself. And I thought this was interesting right here. I don't really have coworker friends that just have coworkers. We just have workers that sit in behind the screen. We lose, again, we lose away this face-to-face -face interaction. We don't go out to lunch. We don't talk about family. We don't talk about life. They're just workers behind the screen. We're all doing the same job. I don't have friends. I just have workers, so why should I fully Trust them. Why should I express myself? Or do we have this relationship uncertainty? Or we think about the status difference with our managers. 
participants said, my manager flipped on me about something I did, but he doesn't even know the reason. And the thing is, I don't even know him either. So he might have a reason why he flipped, but again, I don't know him. He just, or know her, we just have the status difference. So again, why should I speak out? Why should I be creative if I assume that he just looks at me or she looks at me as just an employee? And last but not least, I want to talk about this organizational culture or this assumption. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this because if we had to rate our categories just based off of the patterns that we've seen pop up a lot of times, this would be number one. This norm of the organization is we're too, or they're too busy. We're all too busy. We perceive frenzy. What do I mean by perceive frenzy? And Peggy touched on this a little bit, is that I assume that there's this frantic. There's a lot of things happening. There's things going on. Everyone's too busy. So because of that, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to bother anyone, right? Because everyone's using a computer. So it's kind of like you're taken away from their tasks, and I don't want to be this distraction for the team. I, have, I need help. I need help with something. I have this creative idea. I have this plan. I know I can do this, but everyone is so busy, I'd rather just stay quiet. But like my, with my boss, I think at first, like I didn't want to ask for help because why? I don't want to call him at home. He may be busy. I assume that he's too busy. He's at home. I don't want to call him to somebody's help in somebody's house, so I'd rather just stay quiet. Or you may think, they don't even care, right? She's notorious for like canceling meetings or moving up our meetings. And so like, sometimes I get this point, I get this creativity point, like I got it, I got it, I got it. But then she says, or he says, oh, I forgot, I have something, something came up. So why should I be creative? Why should I give out my creative ideas if my manager doesn't even care? And we think about these assumptions and we may think like, okay, why these assumptions? There may be a reason why. There actually may be a reason why, but why do we come up with these assumptions? And as coworkers or managers, we may give away this busyness nonverbal. And I don't want to get too caught up in my communication major, but 90% of our communication is nonverbal, right? So we think about, we're sitting behind the screen, we're losing this face-to-face -face interaction, so all we have is our nonverbals, this busyness nonverbals, so this cancel appointments, this slow response this distracted conversations, all I have is just that assumption that you're too busy, that I shouldn't be able to express myself, I shouldn't be able to ask for help, shouldn't be able to be creative because this is all I'm given. Mind you, sitting behind your screen, we're not we're losing this face-to-face -face reaction again. This nonverbal is at an all-time high now because that's all we have. Or we may think it's organizational culture. Everyone comes in and a shared stress. Manager comes into Zoom, he's all over the place, she's all over the place. Everybody has to share stress. This energy seems stressful, so I should just stay to myself, not say anything, protect my self-image, my work image, and stay quiet. Or I have this creative idea, and it takes time. It's a process, but there's so many deadlines. It's deadline after deadline, so I can't be creative because the next deadline is away, and I have to just do my job because I'm just a regular employee. I can't be myself. I can't express myself. So now that we know the root of the problem, there has to be ways to fix this. There has to be a way to figure it out. Or recommendations, right? Or, and the recommendation that we have is I first want to start off with this point of over-communication. Again, all we have is this communication, this nonverbals. So I wrote this down. I know it looks like there is chaos, but there is not. There's a reason why. I know I had to cancel this meeting, but there's a reason why. I know we haven't spoken much, but there's a reason why, and then communicating, let me hear your ideas. We have this over-communication, emphasizing over-communication because, again, it cuts through confusion and it cuts through assumptions. And then, as we emphasize over-communication, we have to be aware of our nonverbals, right? Being aware of canceling meetings, being aware of distracted conversations, being aware of these certain things that we may give off as busyness nonverbals. Just the little things. And then over communicating as well. Now I thought this next one was pretty interesting. Because even our participants is quite familiar with remote work, I realized they expressed how they've seen new remote workers struggle with this. Now let's imagine ourselves, right, as new remote workers. We go into an area, we lose face-to-face -face conversation. We're so used to going to lunch with our, with our coworkers. We're so used to going to the next door, asking for help. 
we're now in a new environment where we're not face to face, we're sitting behind the screen. If we need help, we send an email, slow responses, and now we struggle. We struggle. We don't have the tools, or we're given the tools, but we don't know how to use them. And so what I mean by training new remote workers is teaching them how to properly use tools so they can feel comfortable and confident in using them. This opens the door for creativity. My coach always said this, when you know how to do it, you're confident in doing it. So if they know how to use tools, if new remote workers knew how to use the tools, if we were able to teach them how to use the tools, this will open the door for creativity, which heightens their strength and their possibility increases their psychological safety. And last but not least is just being flexible, right? Being flexible with our times. And I, I wrote this as well. As a manager, being flexible and just having lunch, just having lunch with your coworker or as a coworker, having lunch with your friend and saying, hey, I just want to talk about your life. I don't even want to talk about work. Let's talk about your mental. How, how are you mentally? This opens the door for caring because flexibility is just another nonverbal of caring, right? As, as you're, you're flexible, you open this door for caring. It's a nonverbal of you caring. So let's not assume that everything's okay. Let's create this psychological safety in our work environment, in our virtual environment, so we can have a high performance team, the successful team that we always desire. Thank you. The next thing is, um, and all these recommendations came straight from the people that we talked with. And it was interesting because every one of the people we talked with could come up right away with bad examples of, of poor management practices. Um, but every single one of them said, I love remote work and I would not be in a job, I would not take a job where I couldn't be a remote worker. Oh, you know, so that means we have to figure out how to be better managers, right? And the, one of the things that, that struck me was this idea of, um, because I think I communicate busyness <clears throat> probably too much, but like in, in, a, in a workplace, you can walk around, you can look in, you can see, oh, that person's busy. Um, but think about it. How can you figure out if a person's too busy to answer a question online? Because you can't see them at all. So. All you've got is your own assumptions. Like, what's, what's the story you're telling yourself? Well, if the only thing you got was these little cues, like, I'm too busy for you, I canceled the meeting, I can't pay attention in Zoom meetings, um, that's, that's the story I'm gonna tell myself, is um, I'm just too busy for you. And so these little cues that we don't even realize, and if we're not doing this connecting with these remote workers, it absolutely communicates to them, I don't care about you, I don't have enough time, you're just a worker, right? So, you know, it's probably good management practice all the way across, but especially with virtual workplaces, we have to be intentional about meeting with people, even if it's um, 10 minutes a week, Connecting with people, um, I like that example you gave. Um, say the why, why did you make decisions? Um, let, let people understand what's going on, right? Connecting them, with them, how, how are you doing today? What, what questions do you have? Um, those kinds of things. That reduces um, relational uncertainty um, and it provides a space for you to start developing psychological safety and filling in some of the blanks that otherwise will be filled in by assumptions. Um, I think one other thing, that struck me was this idea of feedback. Some of us are not that good at providing feedback. We might be really good at saying things like, oh, great job, oh, you did such a good job, excellent job, um, which, you know, th that can be nice. I like hearing things like that. Um, but think about it, if you are a new worker in a remote space, it's just you sitting in your living room or whatever, um, you really have no idea how you're doing unless someone tells you. And if you're not getting feedback, both positive and a little more um, critical feedback, um, you absolutely won't know how you're doing, how you fit, um, and you're not going to have that psychological safety. So things like watch your nonverbals, things like um, connecting, over communicating, being intentional about communicating, and especially providing um, important feedback, uh, those seem to be the kinds of management practices that we have to start implementing if we're going to be successful in um, the virtual workplace. So that being said, we've got plenty of time. 
Um, some of you have been online workers. So thoughts, questions, input? What do you think? I have a scenario that one of my friends, she works fully remotely, and she had said that there was, there's always someone else's account up in like all the Google documents, so she feels like she's being, like it's surveillance. Oh, like in the Google Doc, like right. someone else is in can, there? Yeah, when you can see, <laughs> and she doesn't know who it's, whose account it is, so she was like, I, it, like, my manager's always opening up all the, my stuff that I'm working on, and her, her perception that she definitely is like, I have to be online like constantly eight hours a day or else yeah. I'm not working. And I feel like, like, how do you like, like take away, like take a step back from the screen and like do something and write on paper because you need to process ideas. And she feels like I don't have the flexibility to do that because I have to be visible online and responding in Slack and all, like right. her entire work day has to be in she's active right well the first thing that pops into my head is there's a psychological safety issue mm -hmm. right do you want to any thoughts on that um yeah i mean I, that is very interesting i never actually thought about that um with that being like many people are in a google doc and a lot of people are seeing that i'll say just for the best so that can improve that psychological safety or develop that is i like the idea of you're online, but you are able to write stuff down on a piece of paper and write ideas down on a piece of paper. And a lot of times, too, if she does have or he or she does have that uh, development, that need that development, is maybe just asking questions like, hey, or if, yeah. if they're curious, like, yeah. you know, I've seen there's a lot of things going on. Do I have to be yeah. in this, in this yeah. further? Do I have to be in this doc? Can I be able to do this? And I believe they'll be able to get the right answer that they need for that to develop that, right. you know, that awareness yeah. of creativity, even as asking for help mm -hmm. within their work environment. So that's oh, the yeah. I like that. Because doesn't it feel like it's more of a management issue than your friend's it issue? Yeah, it is. And she was very, so she has a different manager now, but she was very reluctant. She talked about how she didn't really know the person. Exactly. All these things that you're yeah. talking yeah. about. That, like, I don't know who this person is. And she was a contract worker, so that added the other layer. Oh, yeah? They but just yeah. get rid of her. Yeah, right. Oh. She just did not feel safe and felt like, like I had to overperform yeah. to mm -hmm. keep this role. Yeah. And they don't even know what I'm doing, so I'm... Yeah. Um, and the manager probably has no idea. Yeah. Nope. Right? She's I, feeling like this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's our Dr. Anderson. <laughs> I think that's like the first time I called you that. <laughs> I was curious what role you think workers' expectations um, mm. about relationships play mm. and in building trust between managers and employees. And the reason this came up is on Monday we were talking about remote work in one of my classes. And a student said, well, you know, when you're remote working, you really don't care about getting to, you're just there, you do work, and you know, you don't really care about getting to know employees or it's hard to. And I was thinking, oh, when I'm in an online committee, I really want to get to know people. So I thought people are different, and what role does that play with your expectations and trying to build trust with managers and trust oh, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think with that, I, when I think about like certain things like this, I always think about, because I'm a part of a team, um, and I think about the team, and when there's expectations, there's a goal in mind, right? And a lot of the times, the goal is, the expectations are driven by the goal. So if we have a goal, if the team can have a goal of, we want to be a high-performance team and a high-successful team, then the expectations should follow that and should meet those requirements for that goal. Yeah. So such as, yeah. let's take time to get to know each other. If we want to be a high performance team, if yeah. we want to be just, you know, just a regular team, just someone that's not functional, then we don't have to get to know each other. But if we want to be a high performance team that we all desire, then I think we should be able to get to know each other. Let's actually take the time to get to know each other. Let's yeah. do icebreakers. Let's do things like that to build that trust within each other. Um, only, again, if our goal is to be a high performing team, a successful team. So yeah. I just think that goal, having that goal in mind of what do we want to be as a team, in this, re in this remote work, in this virtual environment, if we want to be high performing, let's lead things or do things to lead to that. So, yeah, that's good.
Oh, that's really good. I mean, it's all about the culture, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of culture do you want in an organization as a manager? Then how do you craft the expectations to meet the goals of their culture? Yeah, that's that's really good. Uh, my question is, um, how do you think age changes this? Oh. Um, and are these the, uh, the people that you interviewed? Yeah. Were is this their first big time job? Um, yeah. Or was this just another job um, that they did? And how, if you looked just at the age difference and stuff, mm -hmm. um, and the people who grew up in the COVID era, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. how would that change things, do you think? Wow. I mean, as far as the sample is concerned, we had um, people of, we really did have people spanning the globe. We had um, business owners, we had uh, executive managers, and we also had people, this was their first job, mm -hmm. you know, lower level. So we had all sorts of levels, different, different ages, no one quite my age, but you know, what else? Um, <laughs> so what do you think? How do you think age would make a difference? I think that I think that does play a big role. Um, but I think as well, with age, I think a lot of times is there's always going to be a mix of age within the remote work. You're going to have some people older. You're going to have yeah. some people younger. Um, and I think as older as the people that's older age, they kind of been through that process. They've been through that you know nervousness, not being able to feel protecting their self image, their work image, because they're new to this. They're young. Um, they have a lot to learn. They've been through that. So if they can, as managers or just people of older age, as coworkers, if we can just, you know, see that and know that, this is the part of the, you know, training new um, employees that we said as a recommendation. If they can see, you know, certain things like that and kind of take them under their wings, like, hey, let's just talk. Let's, you know, let's just communicate. If you need help, if you need anything like this. I've been in your shoes, you know. It's kind of giving the perspective. Like, I've been where you've been at. Um, I think that would definitely help with that. But I do think age does play a big part in that psychological safety just because yeah. you know the younger age is you know it's a lot of social media that's played a part and you know you view things and see things your image in social media and a lot of things take yeah. part in this whole bunch we could do a whole lot yeah. of research on that part but yeah. um I do think that's that plays a big part and with the um the experience part like you said I was a good you brought up a good point when we did our participants a lot of them were familiar with it but it was because of the COVID area like they was you know started in COVID um and then now it's about three years now remote work's been under the belt so and then that's when they brought up the whole training new employees so yeah i think a lot of the experience has a lot to do with that as well but that was a great point that you brought up with the age and i think if we were able to see that as you know older you know co-workers in a sense and with more experience and bring them on their wings i think that would definitely close that gap for yeah. them so and i think it was one of the people you talked with um mm -hmm. she talked about how when uh, some of the some of these workers uh graduated during COVID, has, have never actually worked in an office, um, and are completely lost as far as norms, cultural expectations, how this is supposed to work. And when they have a manager that's not communicating to them, um, it's very lonely and confusing and frustrating. And um, yeah, it's a big challenge. Dr. Bruley. Uh, just a quick question, I'm curious. What was your what was your sample size and at what point did you reach saturation yet? Is that why it's a pilot study or what? You know that I go back and forth on that because so we we got fifteen uh, fifteen people in our uh, sample um, and honestly we it was really clear like the the busyness thing that was mm -hmm. like clear right away uh, relational uncertainty that popped up right away some of the other things. Um, there, there, I'm, I'm not sure we reached that saturation. You know, I don't know if you can reach saturation with 15 people. It feels like we did. I kind of feel like if we're going to get this published in a scholarly journal, um, we're going to have to do, um, some more interviews. Um, I feel like we had a nice variety and still we had that, uh, that coalescing around some of these major themes. So that's a really good question. I've struggled with that. In your for future research or whatever. I was thinking as you're sitting here uh, talking about this, I, th I thought too, um, some of the, the traits of a person, of, of how they feel about yes. remote work, whether they, you know, I think that would be a really interesting thing to connect with this type of thing. Cause some people 
don't want to see people and they want to be alone and maybe the only yep. way can successfully it be more successful behind the screen versus mm -hmm. at work exactly because i can think of people who yep. if they if they had to work in an office would be unemployed you know what i mean because they just can't deal with people but not being in an office they can deal with yeah so i mm -hmm. think i mean it's, I think you guys did a great job. I think you have a lot, uh, a lot of future potential areas. Right, future right. And just to repeat that for uh, the the video, this idea that some people are just designed to work better in an online environment, and other people are not. And we really, you know, some of the people I saw were like, "I am never going back to the office again," and I don't care what I have to do. I'm not ever going back. I'll quit. I'll find another job. You know, and some of those people were like high tech people, which are hard for companies to find. It's like, okay, well, that's important information. Um, but I also talked to some people and it was really powerful. They're, they're like, I am so lonely. There was a point, you know, when I first started this job, I didn't know what to do, you know? And so they've developed strategies like they, they go out with a friend and work, you know, next to each other in a coffee shop or things like that. But um, it was just emotionally such a struggle and they're the ones that need that kind of management. So I think there is a difference in um, what your personality is and, and yeah, that, that's a whole different variable for sure. And you know, a lot of the current research has to do with are people that are at home more productive or less productive? I mean, I've seen so many studies in the last, you know, three weeks on this. Um, and there is, there's no consistent answer. You know, a lot of it has to do with what kind of job it is, what kind of person you are, or what kind of manager do you have? Um, so I think some of those questions are still really, um, haven't really been explored that much. Well, if you have any other questions, hopefully, our goal is to become experts at this because I think just in workplaces that all over the place, workplaces need this kind of information because the old management systems really don't work um, like they used to. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. And um, we'd be happy to answer any questions, any ideas that you have. Uh, and have a very good day. Yeah, thank you.